Good morning, you wonderful people. It's day 25 of lockdown number three here in London, England. And quite frankly, we've had enough. So days have definitely been dragging recently and both Beth and I have been really struggling to feel motivated and positive. <laughs> but today we are determined to get on top of things. So we've decided to spend the day generally decluttering our lives and focusing on some of the minimalist ideas we've been trying to apply recently in an attempt to hopefully give ourselves a bit of a boost. Since Beth and I moved into our own place, we've been thinking more and more about how we can bring elements of minimalism into our lives. I did a Skillshare course by a guy called Greg McKeown on essentialism. We watched tons of Matt Devella videos and have, you know, looked at the work of like Leo Babauta, he's called, who's one of like founders of minimalism. And while obviously we're living in like a house, we aren't like living out of a rucksack, traveling the world with like 52 items to our name. I have a robo hoover, <laughs> but the point is we're trying to live more intentionally and be more conscious with the things we're buying and the things that we have. And obviously minimalism is a whole mindset, like this is just one day, but we've been in a real rut, I think, recently because we're in lockdown here in the UK and have just kind of felt rubbish. So we're hoping to use today as an opportunity to get on top of things, kind of refresh, reset, and hopefully get back to at least like as much as it's possible at the moment enjoying our lives together. So after some smoothie goodness and a review of the number of rubbish emails I've already received this morning, which I will be trying to fix a little later, Beth and I head downstairs to the office. Oh. Ah, my bad. <laughs> my desk is like in the middle of the room. <laughs> Oh, I was shooting a thumbnail last night and then had to move the chairs back in there. Oh. Good start to the day. Strong start. <laughs> now it's important to say that obviously just tidying up isn't minimalism. So first of all, we do have a thorough clean out of our old folders of bank statements and information we don't need anymore. And then file away the paper that we've kind of had strewn somewhere all over our desks and the shelves in the office. And then second, and more importantly for me, minimalism is actually all about taking away all of the clutter that gets in the way of us focusing on what really matters. And in a 2011 study, researchers at Princeton showed that multiple stimuli, i.e. clutter, makes it difficult for people to focus on tasks by competing for neural representation. So a tidy and uncluttered desk improves focus, making that state of flow much more likely. And it's pretty clear in the evolution from my old fairly cluttered desk setup to my current setup, I now only have stuff on my desk that I actually need on a daily basis. And I've got to say, when Beth and I both got to work on Monday morning, we genuinely did feel lighter and like we had a renewed sense of motivation and mental clarity. And another really quick minimalism inspired tip here alongside reducing the amount of paperwork you have is to think about downsizing your wallet or purse. I've ditched tons of the rubbish old loyalty cards and stuff that filled my pretty chunky wallet before to the point where I now carry just five cards in my extra aluminium wallet, which by the way, you can buy through the link in the description. I then sit down for half an hour and get on with the second big decluttering practice I'm trying to work on, streamlining my email. So in past videos, I've spoken loads about the importance of being really intentional with how you use social media to avoid the infinity pools of Instagram or TikTok. But I've kind of neglected thinking about email as though it were itself like always productive because it feels at least for me like it kind of should be. But I have got to the point now where I get an email for every single YouTube comment that comes in, along with tons of emails just suckering me into buying stuff I almost certainly don't need. That mean it's actually now really hard for me to focus on the emails I actually want to receive. Now I do want to move to a better email solution than Apple's native mail app, so let me know if you've got any top suggestions in the comments. But for now, I think a great place to start is just taking half an hour unsubscribing from the rubbish emails you don't want, deleting or archiving tons of these rubbish old emails, and I'm also starting to use folders, so I'm actually using the smart mailbox function in Apple Mail, 
with my email so that they're more manageable in these subcategories. And with the office and my mailbox, places of blissful tranquility now, I convince Beth to come out with me for a little walk to clear our heads. And I say that quite literally because this third idea is one I built into my morning routine a few months ago, and it's a walk alone. So yeah, I really do make Beth go a different way around to me without headphones in or your phone to distract you. Now, I love listening to podcasts, watching videos and reading articles, even when I'm out on walks. But so few of us actually make time for just us, alone with our thoughts and just observing the world around us. And I think it's really important to have some time without these secondary sources of input flooding our brains to allow our brains to have a moment to consolidate everything they've been taking in and for us to reflect on our focuses, our goals, and the reasons we have to be grateful. There's this Blaise Pascal quote that I mentioned in a previous video based on stoicism, which you should all go and watch. All of humanity's problems stem from man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone. And I think the more we're attached to our phones, these sources of external media, the less I think we can be truly happy without these external things. Cal Newport in his book Deep Work talks about the idea of training ourselves when we're in a queue or we're waiting for something not to compulsively reach to our phones to be able to just wait on our own. And for me, it's impossible to begin, I think, to move towards minimalism, to not relying on things, if we aren't first happy to exist without the need for external things to constantly stimulate us. When we get back from our walk, we grab some lunch and Beth gets planning our meals for the coming week. So in general, we have a pretty solid list of maybe 10 to 15 meals that we make regularly. And each week we try out probably one new recipe that we've not had before, hence the cookbooks. So that's hard at work on the shopping list, planning this week's food. Meanwhile, I have my coffee and cake while learning some computer science on Brilliant, today's sponsor. But the key thing here is that it means when I head out to the supermarket, I have a list of every single item we'll need to make all of the meals for the week and all of the lunch stuff we're gonna need and all of the snacks we'd like. And I'm then limited to that list. When I was at uni, I never had a list like this. And so I ended up buying way more junk food, so not really healthy, spent more money, so not great on that front, and crucially had way more food waste than Beth and I currently have. We've got it down to about one 30 centimeter bag of food waste a week. Planning ahead like this also means that during the week when we're really busy, we spend way less time thinking about what we should have, realizing we then don't have all the ingredients we need and all of the stress that comes along with that. While I've been out, the excitement of having an immaculate office seems now to have put Beth in the mood to tidy. So she's been having a big wardrobe declutter and sort out. And I think this is the fifth area Beth and I have really been trying to apply a more minimalist approach to our lives. Now this is definitely easier for me than it is for Beth, but one idea she's told me about that I think is really pretty cool and worth sharing is this idea of the capsule wardrobe. It's basically trying to limit your wardrobe to items that can easily be mixed and matched. So you can create the maximum number of outfits without having to buy tons of clothes. It's also about prioritizing clothes that are likely to stay fashionable, not simply buying stuff that you'll only wear for one season. So yeah, something that we're really trying to keep in mind. For me, over the last couple of years, I've really tried to move away from feeling like every single item of clothing I ever wear has to be branded. 
and from attaching the value and really my value to the cost of the clothes I'm wearing. And now I really just prioritize quality and a good fit over all else. On top of that, I've been looking increasingly to buy more sustainably made clothes. So if you have any recommendations, do let me know. But places like Rapa Nui here in the UK are great. So I do highly recommend you check them out if you haven't heard of them before. I've bought pretty much no clothes in the last year, except for a couple of high quality t-shirts and some summer shorts because my old ones were literally threadbare. You could see my thighs. And I now pretty much rotate between different colored t-shirts, black and blue jeans, and the occasional shirt. And I then have a load of work clothes, which I haven't worn yet. <laughs> and the point here for us both is that minimalism or essentialism whatever you want to call it and however you want to define it is really about living more intentionally and we're doing these small things we're keeping our workspace and paperwork tidy with only the things we really need on a daily basis we're decluttering our inboxes resisting the urge to click through and buy stuff we definitely don't need we're allowing our minds to exist without these other inputs overrunning our own thoughts while we're out on walks reducing our food waste and being more intentional with what we're eating and being conscious in what we wear and what we buy. All of it giving us more time and letting us focus more on our work and on enjoying life together. And ready for the week ahead, we catch up with our families, which is so important at the moment. Beth then makes a delicious ragu and I finally convinced Beth to watch the first Lord of the Rings. Come on, <laughs> the shining light through lockdown as I've previously never had even the slightest chance of getting her to watch it in eight years. And with our greater mental clarity going into this week, we're now also ready to spend some of our free time learning to code or furthering our interest in cryptocurrencies on Brilliant, today's sponsor. So Brilliant tells these kind of interactive stories that reduce what seems like a really complex idea. We're talking multivariable calculus, neural networks, and all that kind of clever stuff powering the future of the world into something you can truly understand. Brilliant says that it guides you to explore the laws that shape our world. And that has been my genuine experience of it so far. The Python course has improved my understanding of the programming language better than any course or app I've ever used before. It allows you to develop this deep understanding with relative ease because everything is so approachable and bite-sized and really strangely addictive, which just feels like a weird thing to say about an educational app, but it really is. The courses focus on developing a sharpness in the way you think through interactive quizzes and challenges. And if you struggle at all with maths or science, for example, I have absolutely no doubt that the way it breaks things down will increase your confidence and knowledge pretty flipping quickly. So the first 200 people to sign up to Brilliant using my link at the top of the description will get 20% off their annual subscription. So yeah, do go and check out Brilliant. And if you enjoyed this video, please do subscribe to my channel and then check out my other video in which I share my top four ideas for avoiding procrastination.